yesterday morning, um, Rose, a developer, actually, a development lead at an aerospace company, went into her office. She was completely soaked. It was raining cats and dogs, right? Her shoes were wet. She was freezing. <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is, she went to her office, um, was really happy to get dry, but also to get into one of the, the topics that they talked about last week with her team, right? Uh, one of the tickets that she's eager to work on um, that they brainstormed about. And, um, and so she starts working, she opens her laptop, she starts working, um, being really immersed in that, in that uh, description of the ticket, and then Microsoft Teams pops up, right? A colleague tells her there's actually a system down, and um, she immediately abandons the task that she has and goes and troubleshoots, and that takes an hour, a little bit longer, right? It's a very tricky problem, uh, but f she finally made it, right? She, she solved the day, sort of less. Um, and so she returns back to the ticket, reads it, and suddenly it's not that clear anymore. Like last, last week, it really sounded like they completely figured out what they're going to implement, how they're going to do it. But now she realizes there are a couple of really questions still open, so she has to reach out to one of her colleagues, but that one is not in the office right now. It will take quite some time, so she has to do something else. She goes back to her code reviews that she sent out two, two days ago, but no progress, right? Oh. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do, uh, oh, there's a meeting. Also, I go to the meeting, I'm coming back, Rose comes back and she's like, oh, what? Um, um, um. Oh yeah, I have something. So she really starts coding, which feels amazing, right? She, she codes, but she wants to commit often and early, so she commits and there's a test failure and she's like, duh. So she goes and she investigates. And it's a flicky test. It's a f test that's a false positive, right? So she's like, ah. So she goes back, um, coding, coding, coding. She thinks, like, should I still commit or no, no? I commit. Test failure. Ah. <laughs> anyway, um, she thinks, oh, this is probably a test failure, a flicky test. So she, she works further. She commits again, uh, trying to keep your good practice up, right? Uh, but another test failure. Ah, no, 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 I have to really investigate. Oh my god. Uh, so she goes, she looks, and a flaky test, right? Like, I mean, this is really annoying. And now she thinks, like, oh, my, my experience today is not that good, right? I cannot really do the work that I want to do. I have obstacles, friction points everywhere that I look at, right? And that's actually developer experience, right? That, that's sort of the essence of uh, what we mean by it. Like, let's recap a little bit, right? She has interruptions. She has system failures. Um, she has unclear requirements, right? She has long response times. She has slow code review turnaround times, right? Flaky tests, all of that really come down on her while she's working, right? Really somehow impacting what she's doing, right? And this is what I have been studying for the last around three years, right? My name is Michaela Greila. Um, and I have been working with engineering teams on their productivity, on their, on their obstacles for over 15 years now. I have been at Microsoft, for example, for the, at, at the one engineering systems team. Um, at that point, it was called Tools for Software Engineers teams. And I was working with all major product teams, right? Office, Windows, um, Exchange. And the teams came and they have, they have problems, right? They have friction points in their workflows, in their tools, in their processes. And that time back then, we didn't call it developer experience, right? We had different terms. You probably heard about you know, effective teams, right? High performing teams, productivity that we are going to measure, right? Um, since six years, I'm working with companies all over the world, actually, helping them get over their friction points, helping to make their processes, their practices, that's that better, right? And in three years, we are really driving into that developer experience um, idea, right? So I'm an independent researcher. I've worked with, with many teams, and I'm going to show you um, three, four papers, scientific works that we did around developer experience, right? So in the initial, the initial idea on developer experience, uh, we were a smaller team. It was Avi Noda. He's the CEO now of a company that has DX as their founding principles, right? Uh, the, the company is called DX. <laughs> Um, Margaret Ann Story, she's a professor at the uh, University of Victoria in Canada. He, she did this amazing work on space, if you're familiar with it, right? It's all about how we measure productivity. 
Um, and, and then it was me, right? And so we did a ground theory study to really understand what is developer experience, because even though I mentioned the things to you, and I think a lot of developers can actually really relate, they're like, yeah, this is, this is what I experience, right? It's still staying very elusive what it means, right? We then um, had actually also Nicole Forscreen join our team. Um, she's very um, popular or very famous also for Dora, for the Dora uh, work that she did uh, with Accelerate and so on. She also was involved with space. Um, and then the last study we did um, where we really correlated a developer experience to outcomes, not only productivity, but innovation, um, creativity, tech debt, right? We really wanted to see what's the impact of DevEx, right? On those, um, let's say, very tangible and very hard fact uh, factors. There, was, um, there were two other people from Microsoft joining us, Irene and uh, Brian. And yeah, and, and, and today I'm really happy to talk with you about that, right? To show you some things. I structured the talk into three areas. So first of all, what is this DevEx, right? So that everybody should go out and have a really good idea of what, what DevEx is. Um, why does it matter? Does it even matter, right? And then, if it matters, how can we improve it, right? How can we make our developer experience better? And this is more a theoretical explanation of DevX, what DevX is, right? We actually grounded it in the, in the uh, trilogy of mind theory um, from psychology. And it just means that the experience is somehow what we feel, is impacted by what we feel, but what we think, but also our value system, what we value about our work, right? So what does that actually mean? It, it means our processes that we experience. It means how much involved are we and, 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 and what do we expect from our work? I really want to um, highlight a little bit also the difference between productivity and developer experience because I'm super excited about developer experience. Why? Because when I was working at Microsoft, and I know a lot of companies, they, they were all very much um, interested in productivity, like how productive are our teams, uh, even worse, how productive is a single person, right? Um, but productivity is a very um, old term, a very old concept. It's actually mainly coming from the industrial revolution, right? Where we have factory workers, you know, um, I don't know, producing shoes or whatnot, right? Uh, we are all knowledge workers. It's, it's a bad measurement, it's a bad concept, actually. I mean, it, it, it has some merits, um, but when we try to measure it, uh, it becomes very often reduced to activity. How much activity do people do, right? It's not about innovation, it's not about creativity, it's how much activity, how much and how, how often can per people do something, right? How many commit, how many user stories. Um, and, 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 and there are really a lot of problematic aspects around productivity. And developer experience is, is a different thing. I, I really like to capture it, and that's uh, my, my, my um, really idea of uh, developer experience. It's doing your best work joyfully, right? Uh, there was like a movement from the productivity, developer productivity side away to happiness, right? So that we come away from this activity-driven thing. But happiness is not covering the real aspects that we care about work, right? We don't want to measure table tennis experience, right? We want to have really a business impact with what we do, right? And so developer experience is not about how happy people are. It's also not satisfaction, right? There are a lot of satisfaction surveys out there. It's about the experience that you have at work, right? I, th I think it's the, the DevOps idea, right? The Dora idea, but it's, it's broader. It's not the delivery performance, which is a very small aspect of what you do, right? And the delivery performance, if you think about it, it's again factory thing, right? So we have a pipeline and we measure how well is our pipeline doing. Developer experience is really more about the human processes as well, right? So what are we doing? And it's about the work, right? Can we do the best work joyfully? So when we did, when we set out to this, to this study, right? We thought like, well, as we thought, there were factors sort of, right? There were things impacting, system failures, friction points. And so we set out to understand what factors are actually impacting developer experience. So I interviewed uh, a lot of people from different companies, developer from different companies, we used grounded theory, really a very thorough uh, way of investigating data. Um, and we came up with actually 
four areas, right? This was the initial work, four areas. First one was collaboration and culture, right? So it's about knowledge sharing, how much knowledge sharing is going up, right? So this is really what came out that people talked about. Um, how much collaboration do they have um, in the departments, right, with their colleagues? Psychological safety was a very important concept as well. Communication, aligned values, getting recognition, feeling connected and supportiveness, right? So when I, we interviewed people and this is what came up, and when they talked about developer experience, that's what Im what, what's impacting, right? And they talked about developer flow and fulfillment. This is all about autonomy, right? How much can I actually influence what I'm actually working on? How much stimulating and challenging is my work? And uh, Charity Major was talking about that, right? Like, we want people to really solve great problems, right? We don't want to, like, have them working very stupid tasks. We want them to be creative, to have innovation, right? Um, how can you make progress without obstacles? There are a couple of other things, right? Uh, there were a group of factors that are related to product management, right? There are clear roles, for example, um, uh, similar like uh, Rose had, right? She's looking for this, for this task and she thought they figured it out, but then realizes there's actually some uncertainty in it. We, we don't know exactly. Can we work iteratively, small, right? Can I commit often? Um, what about our deadlines? Are they reasonable or not, right? And then it's all about developer, um, the development environment and the release. And I think a lot of people often think this is the only thing about developer uh, productivity or dev X, right? So um, this would be your code base health, right? Do you have technical debt? Do you understand the code base? What about your devi uh, development environment? It has, like, does it add friction or do you have smoothless uh, processes that you can follow? What about automated testing? What about code reviews and, and frictionless releases, right? But you can see this is just one part of it. There are actually many other parts that are also um, impacting our experience. Um, so there are, there are a lot of things, right? There are 26 factors actually that we, um, that we um, identified in the, that study. Um, and so the question was, what, what's the most important, right? We can't look at all of them. So what's the most important one? What should people or companies really uh, look at? And when I interviewed people, they were saying, well, in my previous team, uh, code reviews were a total bottleneck. But now, what holds us back is the lack of tests we can trust, right? So I was maybe um, looking at code reviews, tests, and then another person came along and they said, well, as a team lead, I'm responsible for our deliveries. So I care a lot about the release. And if they are not smooth, this is a big headache for me, right? And it goes on like this. So another person says this, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe that. And then I look at the factors that are coming up, and you cannot see a pattern, right? They are all factors coming up under different circumstances. And so what we realize is actually that the FX depends on a couple of things, right? So we saw patterns emerging, we asked more and more people, right? But we didn't see the factors emerge. We saw that, well, the presence of problems influences if it's impacting your DFX, right? If you have big problems, this is impacting your DF. The frequency maybe, right? How often this problem occurs. And expectations that you have, right? If you have seen a, a good test suite and you know uh, how, test, uh, how, how working like that is, then this influences your, your developer experience, your responsibilities, uh, but also the maturity of the company and the goals that the company has, right? So there are circumstances, contextual circumstances that really influence how, um, DevX, how, how much DevX is impacted. But then there was also one thing that stood out, right? So while I say there not, not none of those 25 or 26 factors really um, emerged, there was one thing. And people said, a not perfect code base isn't the reason somebody would leave a company, right? Whereas if you have a toxic culture, that's when people think about and they actually leave your company, right? And so this came over and over. Like if you have horrible colleagues, if you cannot speak up, so culture and psychological safety definitely were some of the factors that really emerged as they are more important than the others, right? So it's not, it's not only your IDE. People think, oh, the IDE, I can quickly fix that, right? Or having another plugin. Um, and this is also what came out if you, if you know Dora, right? And you have looked at uh, Accelerate, the book, for example, and you look at this research that Nicole did, for example, uh, psychological safety came out as one of the real um, driving factors Funnily, people are only looking at the metrics, right? They're, they're only looking at the uh, release frequencies and things like that, not so much about the, the culture and the psychological safety, but it's very important. 
Um, so, and this actually shows us the first part of this uh, developer experience framework, right, that we developed. So the, the facts factors influencing our developer experience and which factor is really important depending on our contextual characteristics. So does it matter? Should you care about it? Is that, is that something that you, you know, should bring up um, with your colleagues, with your, with, your, with your company? Well, to do that, we had another study, right? We, had, we, we correlated developer experience. So in the first one, we, we realized how we can measure it. We can measure it through the factors, right? Um, and when we can measure developer experience, we can then correlate you know, good and bad developer experience to outcomes that we want. Outcomes such, such as creativity, productivity, and learning, especially on the individual side, right? One, how does that impact one uh, developer? Then as team, we came up with code quality and tech depth, right? This is what a team owns as outcome, sort of. And it was, as an organization, we thinking bigger, right? Innovations, retentions, goals, and profits. Um, and so we had those uh, factors, and we grouped them into three different areas, which is flow state, right? This is can you do deep work? Can you have engaging work, right? Um, how, how, how many interruptions do you have? We grouped it into feedback loops uh, that would be getting answers from colleagues, code review approval times, um, and then cogni uh, cognitive load, right? This is really about um, how is your deployment going? How, is, uh, how understandable is the code base that you have? What about your processes and your tools, right? And so we asked people, and we had um, several hundreds of responses here. Uh, we asked them about how is their developer experience? We measured that, and then we correlated that to these outcomes, the productivity, the learning, the creativity, the code quality, and so on. And this is what came out, right? So we actually saw that each one of them is significantly impacting the, the outcomes, right? Except for feedback loops. Feedback loops, somehow, uh, we could only see a significant statistical correlation between feedback loops and team outcomes, right? The tech depth and the code quality. We couldn't really see something about individual outcomes or company outcomes. Um, there is much more information in the paper if you are interested in that. I think what we suspect uh, the reason for that is that when we look at the, the factors that we measured in feedback loop, they are only feedback loops around human connections, right? So this, this is um, how people are interacting. But feedback loops in our developer environment are actually very often semi-automatic or automatic, right? It's how, how fast do I get response from, our, from my build. Um, how fast do I get, even code reviews are actually semi-automatic, right? So I think when we would uh, enhance that in that future work, we would maybe see different outcomes, right? But still very, very interesting outcomes, right? So what we saw is that there's a boost in creativity, in uh, productivity, in learning, there's a better code quality, less tech debt, right? There's innovation, better retention, and goals and profits. So I'm going to show you just a couple of uh, those um, very impressive and interesting numbers, you can look uh, the others up. Um, so what we see with flow state, what flow state gives you is 50% more productivity, right? Nice, without needing to measure activity per se, which is a bad thing to do in very many cases. Um, cognitive load, right, reduce cognitive load uh, gives you 50% more innovation. Feedback loops, having good feedback loops, reduces tech debt by 50%, right? This is what we, what we got. So what do we get with bad DevX, right? Like, well, the opposite. <laughs> um, but there were other things that I want to show you, right? Um, we also, in the, in the study, we saw that people have a reduced engagement, right? They don't want to be engaged that much with the company anymore or with their task. Now, they focus on personal projects, right? Maybe they do more open source work or they have their own little idea that they work on. Um, they validate negative experience. They talk with their colleagues about it, like, oh, you know, this was really annoying and, and, and that happened and so on. Um, <coughs> sometimes the clicker doesn't work. <laughs> they are not speaking up anymore, right? So they see a problem and they're not speaking up anymore because it doesn't work. They're gaming the system, right? Especially if you have nice uh, metrics in place, right? It's easy to game the system. They are, um, <coughs> let me see, they are reactive, not proactive anymore, right? So uh, if you give them a task, they do it, but they're not coming up with their own ideas. They're working overtime, not a good thing. Um, and they're leaving their jobs. 
And now when you look at that, right, I, I found that really interesting. What does that all have in common? Well, it's a sign of a bad culture, right? And the bad culture creates bad DevX, right? And this is the, the cycle that you're getting yourself into, right? So it's a downward uh, spiral that we, that we sometimes have. So I hope that this motivates you a little bit to think about, yeah, actually, we have to care about DevX, right? Um, and I think sometimes when I talk to developers, right, um, it's, it's clear that we have to, that, that it makes a difference. But then for management, especially those numbers are really important that you can go and say, you know, this is like, this is real, right? It's not just me uh, asking for a nicer work environment, but there's really something in it for you. So, once we convinced ourselves and maybe our colleagues and upper management, the question is how can we actually improve it? Um, and um, we looked at the Deming wheel, maybe you're familiar with that, it's a little bit uh, broader, so it has another step, but we looked at the process and it's quite a complicated process, right? It, it, the, the task per se is not easy, so we wanted to have a quite easy method methodology to follow, right? So we don't want to uh, overcomplicate already. Um, the process, so we came up with this really three-point circle that you, that you go and loop through, right? So you identify the problems of the facts, right? The problems, the friction points. You make a plan and you do it, right? And throughout that, you learn. So it seems quite simple, and let's have a look at each of those steps. Well, identify. Well, you identify and understand the problems, and for that you have to gather data, you have to analyze data, right? Um, and very important, think about the, the keynote that uh, Jerry Demetrius gave, right? It's not about just looking at some metrics, it's really about immensing in the data and really looking at the contextual information, what's going on here, right? Um, and then we understand the root cause. We can use the DevX factors for that, right? They are really a guiding principle here, right? So they tell us what are the things that we should actually consider or investigate. How could we do that? Well, there are two very opposite sides, right? The human-centered thing, so very informal. You could have one-on-one -on -one meetings, coffee chats, right? Uh, team meetings, maybe retrospectives, a little bit more structured. You could have surveys, right? to investigate developer experience. You could have interviews with people. Uh, it's much more time consuming. Uh, focus groups, observations, right? Observations would be really sitting and walking with the developers, right? This is happening more in large organizations that have a dedicated research team. Then you could have system-centered information to look at, right? It would be logs, test runs, deployment information. Uh, you could have the, your own metrics, build times, coverage. You could think about DORA or space metrics, right? That you are that you're gathering and you analyze. And then there are some parts in the middle, right? So you could have real-time or contextual feedback. A, a, a couple of companies are really starting more and more to do that. This means like there's an activity-driven uh, inquiry of information, right? So a build just started or finished, and then you ask a person like there's a questionnaire coming up asking, so how was that, right? This, did it lo take long, um, for example? Um, you could do qualitative and quantitative research, which I did, for example, at Microsoft, or people at Google do, or LinkedIn, larger companies do that, right? Or you could do workshops, that's also what I'm doing with companies that don't have their own research department, right? So you could get a really deep understanding of what's going on, and the best is always to have this mixed approach, right? So not only look at the human-centered one, but also at the data, and then com combine it, right? Because it's complementary. So what are companies doing? I, uh, picked three. Um, there is actually some information out there, um, um, for example, at DX. One is Google, right? Google does a quarterly engineering satisfaction survey, right? So it's more about satisfaction because the DevX idea, it's a new one. It's like observability was a couple of years ago, right? Um, and you will see that turn around, I'm, I'm sure. But the, the, the quarterly engineering satisfaction survey, they have metrics around the dimension of speed, Ease and quality, always those three, like a triangle, so that you don't you know, screw it in one uh, direction. And then they have obviously this qualitative and quantitative research that they're doing a lot. LinkedIn has also a quarterly survey, uh, tools, processes, activities. That's the areas that they're looking at. They have this real-time feedback implemented. There are some very nice case studies out there that you can look at as well. Um, and they have system-based metrics. And then Shopify also have a developer happiness survey. So you see, surveys are actually quite frequently used because they're a very good tool for this experience, developer experience measurements, right? They are much better than looking just at metrics that you get from your system, right? It's easier, 
to use it, the metrics, <laughs> um, but often they are leading you into the wrong direction. So if you, if you use now the developer experience factors, uh, you can derive questions out of that, right? Maybe three dimensions, you could have satisfactions, importance, and quantification questions, right? Satisfaction would be how satisfied are you with the speed of the deployment last month, right? Or the importance, how important are frequent deployments to your workflow, right? And then you could also quantify. People are not that bad with quantification, right? You have to look a little bit at, at the research that's behind this uh, survey construction and then know how valid or or worth your question are, right? And be careful of um, how you phrase them. There's actually, from this uh, developer experience study, there's actually a, a, a startup that came out that Avi Noda is the CEO of uh, that really does that for you, right? So they are sort of like, I really like the idea, um, they are sort of like your own um, research department, right? That just makes sure that those questions are very valid, that, you know, they are grounded in, 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 in the truth, right? In, in, in really data, um, they are revising that. So I, I really like that. Um, and it's called the Developer Insights Platform. So once you have those data, right? But once you analyze that, you have to plan, right? You know now your, your, your problems and now you plan. This means that you identify solutions based on your problems that you have, right? You don't come up with the solutions first. You have your problems, then you find the solutions. You set smart goals, you define the success for clear criteria, and you assign ownership. <coughs> Especially the identifying solutions is not that easy, right? So you have to come to a group consensus with your team, right? You have to involve your team. Um, you have to um, define, you know, the feasibility, the, the risk criteria, and all of that. There are several things that you can actually do. I'm not going into that, but um, just so that you're aware. There are different techniques that you can do, brainstorming, five whys, you know, and so on. And then you did the do part, right? And the do part is really carrying out this action plan, right? The tracking the progress, but also the obstacle, right? It's not a smooth path. Um, and then keeping all informed and then continuously iterating over that. When you do, you will hit barriers, one barrier after the other, right? So you have to find new solutions while you're going through solving that problem, right? <clears throat> and so it could be that there is low prioritization. Um, it could be there is a lack of incentives, right? There's maybe an inability to quantify the problems, right? So measurements are often very important, especially if you want people to prioritize things. Um, it could be there is a lack of buy-in organizational politics, so you will face barriers and you will have to come, uh, overcome those and also the obstacles that you have. So with all this information, who is going to solve her DevX problem? Well, Rose, right? Rose thinks like, oh, she was in this talk, she thought like, yeah, this is, this is great. Um, so I'm going to do this, um, this cycle here. Um, and she puts on her, her solving cape, goes back to her company and says, well, this is what we're going to do, right? So she identifies problems. She uses the informal thing, right? So she talks with her colleagues, coffee chats, um, you know, some meetings. She's very eager for the problems that people talk about. And then she hears that people say, well, turnaround times are really long, right? I work on three to four tickets at the same time because um, of the review delay, right? And so this, this parallel work is really taking a toll. I have to jump back and forth, and she recognized, yeah, this is actually my experience as well. And then she looks at one of my research papers, um, and she finds out that actually fast code reviews, we could correlate that really to 20% more innovation, 15% more learning, 15% more creativity, and 10% less tech time. And she's like, I'm, I'm onto something, right? So this is what we are going to focus on. This is this problem I'm going to solve here. So she identifies a problem, she goes to the planning state, right? So solution, smart goals, success criteria, ownership. And so she goes and she has nudges in her mind, right? And there are really nice research studies. Um, one just recently came out about Meter, for example, but there are also other companies that are using nudges to ping, right? This sort of a different notification system, a little bit more smart, a little bit more AI in it, um, to ping people to, to look at the reviews, right? Um, so she thinks, like, this is amazing. It's even empirically validated, right? 
And then she, look at this amazing dashboard that AI generated for me, right? She has this dashboard um, and she generates all this data out of her engineering system and she looks like measuring turnaround times. That's what she's going to do. Um, and she wants a, a, a speed up from 15%. So it's very sad. Ownership is easy because she can do it all herself. So she does that, and now she's doing. Uh, Rose goes to work, and um, she's, she's facing obstacles, right? This with the nudges didn't work out so well. The, the measurement of the hotel turnaround time, she has to you know, get that a little bit corrected. There are things like uh, pots and things like that that screwed hold the thing. But she managed, and, and then she informs everybody that now nudges are coming out, and, and six weeks later, when she rolled everything out, she very eager to see what her team says. So was it, what is the team saying? Like, what do you think? What do you do? Ten percent yeah. <laughs> code review speed up. Like, wow! And the team is like that. Oh my god! <laughs> she was like, but I, I, I did it. Huh? Look at that. Ten percent code review speed up. Like she's is it has at her. That's part of like, wow, this is going the right direction, right? But they are not that happy. They are, they are like really annoyed. And so she comes to me, she writes me an email first, and then we hop on a call, and she's like, Michaela, this went all wrong. This is a stupid idea, like death accent. I did everything. And so then uh, we look a little bit, and we look at some of the pitfalls, right, when we analyze her process. Well, first of all, she was doing it alone, right? It, it, DevX is not something that you do alone. You do it alone for the problems that only impact you. Right, so maybe um, you're not looking at your emails uh, for four hours or something like that, right? Or uh, you're installing a plugin in your IDE and uh, Grammarly to, you know, something like that. But other than that, you're not doing it alone. There were also some problems with the problem investigation, right? See, she missed the root cause of the whole thing, right? And if you miss the root cause, you have a solution to the wrong problem, right? And if you don't have involvement and buy-in from your team, it's not really going well. And the same with the goals, right? If you have the wrong uh, problem, if you have the wrong solution, then it could be that you're also having misleading goals. And uh, how did the charity say? Matrix, right? So, <laughs> um, so let's have a look. Let, let's do it over, right? Let's do it over again. Let's look at the DevX factors. Let's do the identifying phase again, right? So we do it as a team. We sit together and we involve everybody that's um, impacted by that. And when we do that, we realize that, yes, um, something is going on here. Actually, I like, I want to show you again, maybe you check it out, the X, right? So what we can do is, for example, run a survey, right? We can run really an investigation. Let's say we do this uh, DX, for example. And so what they give us is for each of the areas, batch size, build processes at all, they give us really nice aggregated data that give us some idea of where our problems lie. And Ro Rose was really onto something, right? You see code reviews is a problem for all of the teams. So this was true. It's very good, right? So she had a good idea of what's going on here. But there are many code review pain points, right? There's not only slow turnaround times, but there's bullying, there's feeling attacked, there's nitpicking, time pressure, waiting times, large reviews. And some of them are directly related to slow turnaround times. If I have large reviews, I often get slow turnaround times. If I have difficult reviews, I get slow turnaround times, right? And one of the things um, that, that, that's really bubbling up from this you know, slow turnaround times. When I'm working with teams, I'm, I'm also doing a lot of code review workshops, right? Because code review is a big, big problem. I realized that when I was working at, at Microsoft, all product teams, you know, had some best practices, but also really struggled that they had, right? And slow code review turnaround times, they are a symptom, not the cause. That's what I see over and over again. One of the common root causes, and this is, again, very um, um, generalizing, it's not true for every team, but I've seen that really working with hundreds of companies, is, to, uh, for example, that knowledgeable reviewers have a high workload, right? And when we did that with Rose, um, we realized that this is actually also happening, right? It's happening for her. So some people have these slow turnaround times, and some of the group members have actually these really high workloads. Um, but then, this is, again, not the root cause. When we dig deeper, right, when we do um, some, some like, like using some of the methods to really find out what's going on here, we see that people came up, and this is coming from a case study that I did or a, a team that I was working with recently, right? There's a general high workload of experts, 
not only code reviews, just in general. We have our plates full. Um, people were saying, well, but actually we're selecting the same people over and over again, right? Um, we only have a few experts. Huh? Root cause to the same thing, right? Um, then the experts said, but mentoring is really harder than, than doing it by self, right? And I have a high workload, so if I then have to mentor and you know, onboard these people, it's, it's, it's difficult. Lack of confidence, many newcomers, lack of proper tests, right? So you could see there are really a couple of things, and somehow they are often connected. So let's say we are now sort of really getting to the, to, to the, to the yeah, um, to the end of it, right? To the, to the bottom of it. Now we want to plan. So what are the solutions? And again, we want to um, involve everybody to find those solutions. The primary goal that Rose set were improve the code review turnaround times, right? So what we do now, we say, let's reflect on that. Is that, is that really our primary goal, right? So maybe the team comes up with another goal which was good, right? It came up, the primary goal is to improve the code review turnaround time by distributing the workload more evenly, enhancing the skills and confidence of the team members while ensuring that high quality code reviews are conducted efficiently, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a more well-rounded, very long <laughs> goal, actually. Um, but the focus is still on improving code review turnaround times. And I see people gravitating towards that over and over. It's very human nature, right? It's because we can measure it, because it's a, a, a quick win, right? Um, a, a, and actually, Rose even made it, right? Like, he, she had a 10% a, a uh, improvement uh, for her team, right? But you can also turn that around. Like, when we look really at the problem, at the data, at what people told me, right? What we worked together in this, in this workshop, then we could also say, actually, the primary goal is to enhance the skills and the confidence of all team members. And I've seen that over and over again, and with some companies I'm working like two years to really work on this problem, right? Over and over, and it's a slower process. It's a long-term goal, it's a long-term, um, but very sustainable way of looking at it, right? And then, so that code we turn around decrease, so now the decrease is actually um, the result of what we are doing, right? Of our primary goal. The workload is more evenly distributed, Right? And then we ensure that high-quality codes are conducted efficiently. And the, the reason why the team was so negative about it, right? why, they, why they were a little bit like, uh, it was not a good experience, is that, well, if you measure first the code review turnaround times, you have a direct incentive to put it somewhere else, right? To either that the, the experts have to do more work, right? They have to be faster, um, or that you're directly going to people that don't feel confident to do it, right? Or that they have, they are, they're fearing to miss bugs and maybe they're missing bugs, right? So you're getting really a different vibe on the whole thing. So we actually set for the second thing, right? To say, well, the primary goal is to enhance the skills and the confidence of the team members. And really setting that, and it, it depends, right? It could be that the first one um, is the right thing for, for one team, but in many, many cases, the second one is actually the harder one, but the better one. And Depending on where you set your goal, you also have different solutions, right? The solutions really change based on how you define your goals. So what this team came up with, they said, well, we could have changes to the review selection and notification system, like Rose did. We can increase knowledge transfer. We can praise good work, do reviews of reviews, um, hire more people, you know, have better code review descriptions, tag low skill, low, low risk uh, code reviews, and add AI reviews, right? And then you have to rank the solutions. And so we did that, right? There's low hanging fruit thing. Then you have to think about the impact on your goal, the feasibility, the ease, and all of that. There are actually more things, but I just mentioned a couple of them. And so this is actually the, the action plan that we came up with for that team, right? So we said, number one, and this is important because this is correlating directly to our goal, is increased knowledge transfer between experts and others, right? And this means that, for example, they do public code review sessions, right? Or knowledge transfer sessions. So it means that, for example, every uh, Friday, um, the, the ones that are considered expert would do the review, but then people can join via Zoom or Teams or not, and they are walking them through how they are doing the review, right? So this is a this is actually a nice um, balance between them not having another responsibility; they can do their work, but also others are listening in and can learn, right? Um, some of the team members were really thinking about knowledge transfer sessions, so these are dedicated meetings where people explain the system and you know tell them what they are looking for and things like that. 
And then they also said, well, they want to implement the reviews of reviews, right? So while other like non-experts or people that are just building up their skills, doing the reviews, they will have a final round of review, right? They will look at the review and say, well, this is really good what you did here. Here you missed something. I would have done this differently. And then the second step, and this is important, it's the second step, changing the reviewer selection criteria. And we are not completely changing it, but it's a two-step process, so we define low low risk changes first, and then we update our selection criteria for low risk changes, not for the overall system, right? It's more involved, um, but it also uh, ensures that we are still producing high quality code, that people can build up their confidence, um, and then we alter notification and judges. And there's a low hanging fruit, giving more brace, right? So uh, we can do that uh, anyway, and it's, it's really a powerful thing as well. Yeah, so, um, as we said, like the prior or before, we had like this return uh, turnaround time as a success criteria with the 15%. Rose was really close to it, but it was not really helpful. So now we change it, right? We are throwing that out, and some people will be very sad, right? <laughs> uh, and we say, well, but let's let's measure somehow our improved review confidence and knowledge, and that's harder to to. Um, to measure, right? But it's not impossible. Actually, surveys are really valu uh, valuable and very worthy tool, for example, to do that, right? So what we want is a 10% increase in self-reported confidence and knowledge scores among um, reviewers within three months, for example. We could also measure, for example, or look at increased participation in code reviews, right? Like, um, let's say we want 85% of the team members really work um, regularly participate in code reviews, right? And then we also have to look at uh, ownership and responsibilities. This is important. Some, sometimes people forget about it. Um, but if we forget about ownership and accountability, this is going nowhere, right? So we have to do that. I, I, I don't go much deep into that. Um, but yeah, the team lead knows, for example, the, they are the improvement process owner, so they really keep track of it. So Rose said, I'm going to do that. The experts have a role, right? Their role is really knowledge transfer. Um, and the team members, it's participation, right? Being there in the knowledge transfer sessions, trying to, you know, skill up uh, during code reviews and do, just do them. Sometimes it's not working, but ah, no. So and now is the do part, right? So carry out the action plan, track and progress obstacles, keep all informed. So what happens now is that it's not all going well. And that's for sure, I can, I can guarantee that, right? And so what happens here, for example, is that for some um, team members, they said actually this knowledge transfer, transfer sessions for 4 p.m. on Friday, and not a lot of people showed up, right? <laughs> well, it was a good idea, but you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, people have other things to do on a Friday afternoon. So they have to, and what, what do we do then? We say nobody shows up, oh, this doesn't work. No, we have to come up with solutions again, right? We have to do this whole cycle. That's a continuous cycle, a little cycle in the do itself, right? As I said, there will be obstacles, there will be barriers, right? Um, the low, uh, attacking low code reviews, there was a disagreement. What is low risk, right? Like, and we had to refine that over and over again until we had something that we could actually work with, right? So we make a plan, and the plan is not working. I mean, I can tell you that. It's not working. Things will be different than you think. And then you, have, don't, you, you cannot give up, right? And that's, part, um, that's why it's so important to have accountability, to know who is responsible for what, right? So, and here it's a team lead. It could be very, uh, a very different person, right? It could be product management or whatever. Um, but here Rose knows, okay, this is not working. I see nobody participates there. Um, I see that maybe there's a, an expert that does this uh, public code reviews, but that person is not talking at all, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to go on the next session because he's just clicking around, it's super boring, right? So maybe that's not working for that person. Maybe they have to have a different way to share the knowledge, right? And then we have to abstract a little bit from our concrete measures and think, what is our goal? Our goal is to share knowledge. So how can we enable the people that we are working with to share knowledge, right? Trial and error, there will be a lot of error. Well, six weeks later now, right? Um, Oh, this is not what happened, right? <laughs> we hope that this will happen, but this is not what happened. But what we want is that we do our best work joyfully, right? So we will not have like this, everybody will be smiling and everybody is happy and everybody is fun. There will be people that think like, it's really annoying that I have to share my knowledge, right? Like I have something else on my plate and I don't want to work with that person, right? So this is life. We will have ongoing problems we have to solve. Um, 
but hopefully we are a step further in doing our best work joyfully, right? And if we are enabling people that, they will be okay, you know, like with a little bit of more knowledge sharing. Um, and maybe they get back, you know, a, a lot of um, positive energy from their colleagues because they're, you know, knowledge sharing and because they're having this supportiveness. And these are actually DevX factors and this increases, you know, the culture and the, the, the work that we are doing together. Well, with that, I actually want to wrap up, right? So I actually showed you the whole complete framework uh, that we developed in uh, this research and that we developed also with working a lot of companies, right? So Avi Noda, as I said, um, has this DX company that came out of this research and uh, he has, you know, we have data on hundreds of, of developers, thousands of developers, hundreds of companies that we really see what are the factors, how are they impacting, um, and, and people really, really like it. Um, and um, we have this developer experience, the factors that are coming in, there are a lot of um, blueprints already out there if you want to have a look at questions, for example, that you can download, you can tweak them um, for your own uh, need. Contextual characteristic really impact that, right? And then we have these improvement strategies and the improvement barriers, and they really make a loop here because it's it's ongoing like that. It's not like we set out and we do it and we do it, but we have to trial and error, right? We will have barriers, we have to find solutions, we have to improve. But if we are able to get our good DX up, we get more retention. People are staying at our company, right? Uh, people have less tech that they have high quality code, right? We have um, innovation, creativity. So all the goodness are, is coming out of that. And I hope you're not going down. So uh, with that, I want to finish my talk. Um, there is a lot of the, the research, not everything is um, out there completely free to download, but there's actually um, the actionable framework for understanding and improving developer experiences. This is on Awix, so this is a preprint that you can download. It's very close to the final version on, I think, IEEE or something. And then there are ACM papers that are all public, uh, public access, right? So you can really look at that and read it. Um, yeah, and uh, say hi if you if you want to chat about developer experience or productivity. I'm super eager, or you can just find me around. I'm here today and tomorrow.